Welcome to Human Histories. God bless you all. God save the king. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The keen sense of responsibility and devotion to duty displayed by Sergeant Prince is in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflects great credit upon himself and the armed forces of the Allied Nations. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Ashton. Welcome to Human Histories. Today I'm joined by my uh, co-host Riley Osborne and we're going to be talking about Tommy Prince, who was a native Canadian war hero who lived a pretty heroic life but uh, unfortunately met a bit of a tragic end but before we get to that we're going to talk to you guys about how you can support the podcast yeah so a couple ways to support the podcast the best way is to hit the follow and subscribe button depending on whatever platform you're listening on because we do this every week also follow us on all of our socials at human histories podcast so that's instagram facebook email us at human histories podcast at gmail.com and if you want to support us financially hit up the patreon but other than that just enjoy the show you know, be part of the community. Let's dive right into it. All right. So Tommy Prince, he was one of 11 children. Um, and, you know, right off the bat, try to imagine having that many siblings, like competing for love. Yeah, my attention. mom has 11 like, siblings, and I think it's definitely insane. <laughs> Bro, I was I was one of four. And like, I, I feel like I feel like my parents didn't even know I existed. Yeah, at the time, I can't so. I can't imagine that personally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, he, um, Tommy Prince, uh, one of 11 children, he was born in a canvas tent in Manitoba in 1915. Um, and if you believe in bloodlines or are interested in uh, something along those uh, lines that are the superstition, he was actually the descendant of Peguis, a Salto chief, and both of those are probably butchered, but bear with me. Um, so maybe he had nobility, you could say, in his blood. Uh, but not much is known about the earliest stages of his life. Uh, what we do know is that his father was a hunter and trapper, and we can assume, given how Tommy Prince turned out, that a, a successful one at that, and um, he would take Tommy with him from a young age. And this led to Tommy uh, developing marksman skills, you know, tracking skills, survival skills out in the wilderness, all of which would have uh, aided him greatly in World War II. And we'll talk about that in a little bit once we start talking about special forces and some of the traits that some of those guys have. Um, but he also, before we get to the war, uh, he had attended a residential school, Elkhorn Residential School in Manitoba, and he had completed up to grade eight. Uh, and for those of you listening who are unfamiliar with residential schools, uh, we, we can tell you with certainty, um, and this is certainly my opinion, I, I'm, I don't know about Riley, I assume it is, uh, he shares the opinion that it's a stain on Canadian history. The purpose of these schools, put plainly, was to enact a cultural genocide upon the Native American population. The government of Canada would take these children away from their families and board them in schools that were often too great of distances to allow for family visits. So imagine imagine you, um, <clears throat> the government comes to your house one day and they, you know, you have kids and they say to you, hey, you know what? Uh, we don't like the way you're raising these kids and we want to civilize them in the way we see fit. So they take your kids and they blow up your car and they say, by the way, he's going to be in Saskatchewan. Um, so how, how are you going to go see him? You have no contact to him anymore. They essentially kidnap these children uh, with the full power of the law on their side and subject them to what you could call horrors and be fully accurate in doing so. I mean, just to dive in real quick about the residential schools, 115,000 uh, Native Americans were sent to these schools against their will. Something like 3,200 recorded deaths happened there, and it's assumed that a considerable number more died in these uh, quote-unquote schools, which is a stretch to say the least. You know, I don't think it's my opinion that they were horrible. I think that it's pretty factual that these were horrible. If you don't share that opinion, uh, you're wrong. <laughs> you should really research you know, uh, the past couple episodes, we, we talk a lot about how history is hard to pinpoint. This is something that's not difficult to pinpoint. This is something that we know factually that that hundred plus years of Canadian history is some of the darkest in Canadian history. And it's something that we will actively, hopefully pursue to, you know, make amends for as best we can. And he, he was a member of those schools. And, you know, like, think, like, 
When we last episode we were talking about Attila the Hun, the episode before that, and we often involve Rome in that because that's what Attila was involved with. And one of the things that happened a lot in that era was, you know, you'd go conquer a village, you'd take you'd kill the men, you'd take the children and the women as slaves, right? So this is kind of in a way, this is kind of that, but in modern times. You know, when you like we talked about last episode how, you know, twenty thousand dead and you can't really grasp the magnitude of that because you know, maybe you know one person who dies every couple of years, and not 20,000, unless you're in a, a war-torn country or somebody that's uh, in an unfortunate enough situation to be around that. But it, it's hard to believe, it's hard to conceptualize, but this literally happened 100 years ago, and the last school closed not 25 years ago, right? And so there's people walking around today in our, our, our society who are feeling the effects of these terrible schools again. There are people that are, that are walking around that were in these schools that are still yeah, alive exactly. today. Yeah. You know, it's unbelievably recent. So that's what I mean, right? People who have these scars, right? Not and that not not to say anything about even the familial scars of like maybe your mother was in one of these schools and she brought that PTSD home with her, right? When after she had given birth to you. But anyway, after he leaves, you know, he he graduated in grade eight, so he was still quite young at the time, and he started going and working in like laborious jobs, right? Um, and before, sorry, yeah, I would say before we get to that, like before, like before they were even taken away from their families and after they had taken, been taken away from their families and, you know, before any of the, those torments at the schools began themselves, they were estranged from visiting each other. So you basically, maybe you were seven years old and you were attached to your mother and now you, you wouldn't see her again for years at a time. And what the government of Canada implemented was a, a, a pass system. And, you know, maybe a, a pass system, you'd think like that's actually reasonable, but this is inherently unreasonable. And you'd have to get permission from a government official within your district to go to the residential school to visit your children. But these guys were, they, 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 they were prejudiced against Native, Native Americans or Native Canadians, however you want to say it. So if they would never, they would never allow it, right? Like the rare case, maybe you had to have money or something to bribe these guys, butter their hands, but you, you couldn't even go and see your children, even if you had the means to, unless you had these, these passes, by the way, these, uh, these schools were administered by Christian churches. So, you know, and if we look at the track record of the Christian church with them and going and uh, delivering God to people, it often ends in a terrible hand for the people that they, their uh, missionaries for. And not only that, they would prevent the native children from learning their ancestral languages and history and cultural traditions, forcing them to learn and speak either French or English. So, you know, reasonably what this inevitably led to was generations of Native Americans who lacked the ability to fit into their own cultures and who were assimilated. And I, I do that with air quotes because they absolutely weren't. They were just stripped of their identity and still uh, discriminated against it. But now they had no cultural background to fall upon. So they were essentially lost um, into our Canadian culture. And, you know, we still see the ramifications of this today, as we were alluding to earlier, and the f forms of drug abuse, suicide, PTSD, and other issues within the community. Yeah, so... To get onto a better note, it is during this time that he joins the uh, army cadets. And the army cadets are a very old establishment um, for teens, people that are too young to join the military. And they still sort of want to seek that structure, community that the military does offer. And he, he does this, right? And he becomes an army cadet and he does that for quite a few years. And then when it comes time and when he's an adult, he sees World War II has begun, and he decides to join the Canadian military. And unsurprisingly, the Canadian Armed Forces uh, wasn't too keen on Native Americans joining. Now, if you know Canadian history, this is about as ironic as it can get, seeing as without the support of Native Americans, um, the British and Canadian people that were living here most likely would have lost the War of 1812, and Canada wouldn't even be a country. So, to have a country founded on the support of Native American warriors not accepting Native American warriors is pretty ridiculous. But Tommy Pierce, Prince, sorry, Tommy Prince being the man he was, persevered. And he kept applying. He didn't quit. And by 1940, at 24 years of age, he successfully enlisted with the Royal Canadian Engineers. If you don't know what engineers were doing at the time... They were mostly quite 
labor intensive work. They were building a lot of necessary tools and structures that the front line would use. And they were often clearing obstacles. And they're still, you know, around to this day. They do consist of a slightly different role nowadays, uh, you know, with bomb disposal and stuff like that. But at the time, it was it was really labor intensive. More of like a support and logistics element as opposed to a go get some element, right? No, uh, Chimos get some nowadays still to this day. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. What what'd you call them? Chimos. That's their nickname. Chimos. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, combat engineers they they're you know a lot of the they do a lot of the bomb disposal work um so a lot of explosive breaching stuff like that so you know they're definitely getting after it now what i was trying to say actually was back then they were getting after it a bit less than they are now so they were a bit farther away from the front lines um more facilitating getting after it exactly right and, and building building and and getting the the stuff that they would need for for the front line so it was super labor intensive and it's also isn't really what Tommy was great at at the time. You know, he's a hunter. He's a tracker. He's amazing at soldiering, really. Um, and he isn't really using these skills. So when he sees a opportunity to join the paratroopers and apply for the first special service force, he jumps at it and he gets in there and he joins what would then become the famous Devil's Brigade, which is a joint Canadian American special operations commando unit. You know, to this day, Canadian and American Special Forces recognize this unit as their origin, which is pretty cool. And Tommy Prince was a member of that. It's a sick name. Oh, it's badass. It's actually what they were recognized <laughs> yeah. as, you know, yeah. the Devil's Brigade. Yeah. They did isn't, some unbelievable a, um, work. I think uh, I may be wrong reading about this, but it's either, I think it, it's either Seesaw or JTF2, like the, the dagger with the wings. That that comes from the Devil's Brigade, right? Like one of their patches is like... Yeah, I mean, Seesaw, which is Canadian Special Operations Regiment. From what I know, they they still use that emblem. I'm not positive. Though. I yeah. have to double check. I just I know I one of them I, does. Yeah, I think it is. That's that's legit, man. Like that's a, and it's a cool looking emblem too. I mean, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> like it, it's such a cool part of Canadian history is that, um, you know, these units were around so so early, you know, and these are the I think the forefathers of special operations as we know it today. It's, I think it's a really interesting thing about uh, our military here in Canada, how, you know, like the United States, like, you know, state of the art, everything, like incredible amounts of manpower, like obviously they're going to be formidable, but in World War One, World War Two, and even in the recent wars in the Middle East, it always seems like, it almost seems like you look at Canada and you'd think like, like especially in World War One and World War Two, like a lot of our, our manpower was volunteer, right? And you'd look at it and like, well, they don't have that incredible formidable of a force, right? But then there's something, something happens to Canadians when, when war starts, right? And they, they, Dude, they go from like, the hockey oh, hey, pucks hi, get transferred I, into yeah, machine yeah. guns. <laughs> it, it, it goes from like, oh, hey, how you doing? Yeah, have a nice day. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> to like blood, bloodthirsty animals, man. Dude, I mean, Canadian history is, Canadian war history is um, pretty incredible. And what's cool about this story is Tommy Prince is involved in a lot of it. You know, and he's involved in it in multiple different facets and he just keeps pushing through. You know, it's hard to track down exactly what he was doing, exactly the missions that he took place in. But we do know a couple, you know, specific important missions that he went on because they were written down because he was given medals for these unbelievable acts of bravery. You know, and it's crazy because he was in Italy, which is a lesser known but super vital Canadian led mission uh, in World War Two. And during the Italian campaign, Prince operated in a lot of different missions, but he, you know, went back to his tracking roots and his his roots in hunting and experience doing all these cool hunting trips with his dad. And, and also, you know, like, let's just look at Native Americans history, right? They're unbelievable hunter gatherer people, you know, and they've been doing this for I don't even know how long, but thousands of years. And he's taking all that knowledge and all that information and applying it to to warfare. And you know what? As I'm on that point, a lot of like hippy dippy people like to paint the Native Americans as these like peace loving, like kumbaya people. And I, I find that such a disservice to, to the people that lived here, you know, f far before us. 
these are warriors, man. Like the Native Americans that lived here before us, the indigenous people of Canada and America and South America, they are warriors. They are the utmost definition of of that word, you know, and, and Tommy Prince is an embodiment of that. He's going on reconnaissance missions in Italy. He's going up to 200 meters away from German positions, okay? And he's dragging 1,400 meters of radio wire to that position with him. If you've ever seen Enemy at the Gates, there's this one scene where this guy's like laying wire and he's like kind of like bobbing his head along and the sniper just blows his brains out. And I always like think about that scene. This is a massive like spool of wire that he's somehow concealing getting it within 200 meters of an enemy position and then sitting there for days relaying information of the enemies. And it gets to the point where German artillery destroy part of his wire, right? And he dons this weird like farmer's outfit, goes out into clear sight of German positions, walks along pretending to be a farmer, shakes his hand at both sides of the line, you know, pretending that he's upset with everybody in this war, bends down to to fix his shoelace. And while he's fixing his shoelace, he fixes the radio line that's been severed. So it's not this like cut and dry mission that he does. He He's able to get in and, you know, pull off some, a level of reconnaissance that's unbelievable. And like I was saying, this is just one example. He was doing this time and time again. And bear in mind, this is, there are literally German soldiers like 200 meters away just staring at him like, what is this guy doing over here, right? And they're just passing him off as a farmer, right? Like, imagine the, the grapes you have to have to pull that off, man. Yeah, and it's not That's like Tommy incredible. Prince like, looks Italian, you know? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like, right? Yeah, it's pretty easy to spot on a Native American in Europe. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, and But he gets the military medal for this, and it's it's cited that... Sergeant Prince's courage and utter disregard for personal safety were an inspiration to his fellows and marked credit to his unit. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. Six months later, the Devil's Brigade had entered southern France. And on September 1st, Sergeant Prince and a private scouting deep behind German lines near, I don't know how to pronounce that, Les Carennes, located the gun sites and encampment area of an enemy reserve battalion. Okay, battalion's about... Battalion is a lot of guys, <laughs> especially seeing it's just Tommy Prince and one other private. And Prince and this other private, they walk 70 kilometers across rugged terrain, mountainous areas, and then they report the information and led the brigade, which is a bigger unit than a battalion. <laughs> if you don't know, you know, mil- I'm not going to dive into military sizes of units, but he, di- he he leads them back to the encampment. Some stories... Some stories do say that they did this without food and water. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I think that's a bit of storytelling, but it's still a pretty amazing accomplishment. See, it that's that is a, that's a patrol, right? Like what he did there, that was a patrol, like a really long patrol, right? Like a recon mission like that. Well, I wouldn't, Would I wouldn't considered... call that a patrol, because no, okay, it depends. So... Okay, I mean, we're not going to get into the specifics. Specifics, you could kill that a reconnaissance patrol. You could say that that's what that okay, is. Okay, see. It, and I just wanted to bring this up because, like, I'm obviously a civilian, never served. I mean, join the reserves eventually, but not tomorrow. Um, but again, because I follow a lot of people who were uh, previous special forces just because they're such cool dudes. Anyway, when I hear patrol, you know, as a civvy, I think, like, I think, like, somebody just walking around a base at night with a flashlight. Like, all right, everything's good here, boss. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you don't think, like, 70 kilometers over mountainous terrain to just to go and scout an enemy position to basically... You're, you're pulling an advantage out of nothing, right? Like, you take these ex- ex- incredible individuals and you make them do incredible feats and you're creating advantage for yourself, right? And that's what he did for him and his brigade. Yeah, but this story gets even crazier. And... This is, again, I'm not positive if this happened because there's a couple different stories detailing what happened. And, you know, it's just him and one other guy. But there's a few, there's one telling where on the way back, Prince and this other private, they come across a group of French partisans. So like French rebels that are pinned down by German soldiers. And they take up a sniper position and just start engaging a much larger force than them and are able to rout the German 
the German forces that have surrounded these French partisans. And then when they go down to say what's up to the French guys that they've just saved, the French guys were just blown away because they thought that there was like multiple people saving them. It was just Tommy Prince and one other private. That is going, that is the definition of going above and beyond during your mission. He's succeeded. You know, he's successfully scouted out an enemy battalion, but he doesn't stop there. When he sees a problem, he engages the enemy. Tommy Prince is the definition of a hero, you know, like, like he's just, he's such an unbelievable story of just heroic action, you know, coming from nothing, you know, coming from less than nothing, being disadvantaged, like distinctly disadvantaged by the country that he was living in and still proving heroics over and over again, you know, and, and we'll get to this a bit later, but that's who he was as a person. He was someone that really, he didn't sit back and say, oh, woe is me. You know, he said, no, you're wrong and I'm going to prove it. And that to me is, is the thing to take away most from this story of this in- incredible individual is his refusal to accept anything other than what he believed him and his people deserved. And that's just unbelievably inspiring. It's pretty remarkable. Like, considering the fact that like you said like he came from rags not only worse than rags he came from discrimination he like the, the entire not even not just the deck the entire casino was stacked against him right and yet after going through the residential school system and enduring all that he endured like the fact that he could remain positive and have that optimistic outlook of like i know what i'm capable of i know what I'm, my worth is and i'm going to show people what my worth is like you'd think like a lesser man would have just gotten embittered and said, you know what? You guys don't like me. You're going to treat me like this. You're going to discriminate against me. All right. You know, and then that's a big middle finger to everybody else. Like he's going to, it's going to make him, it's going to make him go the opposite direction where why should I bother trying to improve myself and blah, blah, blah. Like, but no, he, there's something so incredibly noble about the fact that he always strived to be better. Yeah. And, and, and uh, he brought his people along with him every time he did that. You know, he never forgot his roots, even though, you know, Canada and the Catholic Church intentionally tried to strip him of his native heritage. He never forgot that, you know, he, he kept with his people. He, he proved people wrong time and time again. And it's just an awesome story of resilience. And yeah. which is why we're telling it right now, because a lot of people exactly. don't know this story, like an a alarming amount of people don't know this story. Yeah, I didn't until you told me, and I'm assuming you know because of your time in the service, right? So. Well, he was. We'll get to this in a little bit, but yeah, we served in the same same unit eventually, so that's how I knew about him, right? Yeah. So after uh, after all of those heroics and his service in uh, World War II, uh, the war wound down. 1944, the Devil's Brigade was disbanded. Um, I don't know if it was disbanded or just dissolved, but uh, I, I I don't I think those terms are. Well, yeah, you know, after the after the war wound down, the Canadian military was this massive, like we had 400 military ships. We were one of the biggest militaries on the planet. And, you know, that was completely unsustainable. So they, they had to wind down their size and they honorably discharged him because they were like, you know, we don't need a million yeah. soldiers anymore or whatever it was. Yeah, but once he... Uh... Once he did get back to the land of the free, <laughs> he... Uh... He began a cleaning company. So again, you know, gets off the boat, gets right after it. Uh, he, was, he utilized funding from the Canadian Department of Veteran Affairs, which is probably the only thing you could say the Canadian government ever did for him. Um, it wouldn't be long, however, until Tommy decided he wanted to do something more impactful. Uh, he had been elected chairman of the Manitoba, Manitoba Indian Association, a role which he hoped would allow him to change the lives of Native Americans, men just like him, women just like him, children, save them from the fate that he had already seen. Unfortunately, though, uh, some revisions were made to the act, but very few, few improvements followed. So, you know, some things never change in government. The, hey, yeah, we'll take care of you guys. Yeah, don't worry about it. We're going to fix it. And then you turn around and are like, man, fuck, who's this guy, right? Um, th- though not as casual and not as lighthearted as that, because these are people's lives and, you know, an entire culture of people. Let me just state that. Um, but yeah, he was witnessing firsthand, the uh, the red tape and bureaucracy of government and he didn't like it. So eventually he said, okay, well, I'm going to go back to Manitoba. And he did only to find that the friends that he had left his cleaning company in charge of, uh, they had crashed his vehicle, his cleaning company's vehicle. And I'm assuming he only had one. Um, and then they basically just stripped the vehicle and all of his materials and sold it for parts. So 
you know, he's he's trying his best, but it seems like everywhere he turns, there's just adversity like kicking him down, right? But still, uh, 1946, he would go on to work in lumber camps and concrete factories to make ends meet. Um, yeah, and then, you know, Korean War starts winding up. And uh, it was after after that happened, he was and not able to find consistent employment and whatnot. And realistically, he probably didn't need a good excuse to try and go back to the military. Because from what I gather, people who join the military often, like some people who join the military, like they... They, they stay in it for a reason, right? Life Lifers, like they, they like the structure, they like the community, they like the camaraderie, they like the, the physical job. Uh, but yeah, he was um, able to re-enlist and uh, return to his previous rank. And yeah, he was back at it and headed to Korea. And this is the really cool thing. Like I, uh, this is where like we have a, uh, a direct tie-in for personal history here. And that's the fact that my, my good friend Riley, he actually, he served in the PPCLI. Yeah, so Tommy Prince joins the PPCLI, which is one of the oldest units in Canada, unit that I proudly served in. What does that stand for? Oh, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. And he was part of three PPCLI, which is not the battalion I was in, but whatever, it's all the same regiment. And we can only imagine how important this was for Prince, because you get the notion that he was a man who strived to do good and to be better. And against all odds, you know, a quote from him regarding his return to military service really illuminates this is he said, as soon as I put the uniform on, I felt a better man. And, you know, it's interesting because as we just went over, even in his time outside of the military, Prince doesn't just sit around and not strive to improve the lives of the people that he's around. You know, he tries to do the political thing. And, you know, he was a guy that was a military veteran. And before that, he was a labor worker. I, I just, I can only imagine how frustrating the red tape and just general nonsense that is the political system would have would have been like to him. So I, I can only imagine that, you know, getting that uniform back on and being part of the community that is honestly, in a lot of ways, great. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, you know, the military is often a place where people of different communities and backgrounds can get together and work well together. So I think that that also could have potentially been a reason why he felt so much value within the military was that the people he was working with were of a higher standard than were outside of the military. So, you know, due to his... Plus... Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Plus when you like, when you look at the military, like you just said, people of different backgrounds, communities and standards, like maybe... Maybe these people would have been prejudiced to him and discriminatory to him had they met him on the street in Manitoba and Winnipeg. But when, you know, shells are landing 20 feet away from you and you're, you're in a foxhole and you have to charge an enemy position, the guy to your left and right are white dudes and you're a Native American, they do not care the color of your skin or your background. They care that you're competent and that you're going to be able to keep them alive, right? And so, like, a lot of those silly cultural um, uh, divisions are, are just, like, they're just dissolved once once you're put into that position right so you can only imagine how that might have felt for him because like he back in as a civilian like people people just they treat him like he's a native first and not a man but in the military people look at him as this guy is a competent soldier and he is my brother in arms and i want him by my side right absolutely you know he's a hero it's really interesting i I, it's a very interesting experience when you put on a uniform and people treat you completely differently you know i've been a bartender and i've I've, you know, done Remembrance Day ceremonies in uniform. And it's so funny because to me, it's like, man, I'm the same person, but people treat you so differently, right? And so I think that that's probably what he's feeling. And I don't want to put words in Tommy Prince's mouth. I'm never going to do that. But I'm just trying to paint the picture of why being a military member might have been so important to to Tommy Prince. You know, I feel like he recognized that he could make a difference and he did make a difference. You know, this guy was the definition of, I've said it a couple times, but he's the definition of a hero. And he has a ton of experience. You know, let's jump back to the story. He's in Korea now, serving in another war after having experience in, you know, one of the greatest wars, doing a lot of reconnaissance missions. I think that his previous leadership recognized that his value was as scout reconnaissance leader. And even in Korea, they still knew that that's what he was going to be, a specialized leader at so that's what he really focused on he focused on what's called snatch patrols and this would be traveling into enemy territory and launching stealth missions on the enemy anything from 
you know, sabotaging enemy positions to gathering intelligence or, you know, snatching enemy combatants and bringing them back and questioning them. That's what Prince was focused on doing primarily, you know, but Prince had spent his entire adult life either working hard labor jobs or being in the military. So at this point, you know, his knees are completely shot. His body is starting to fail him. So he's unable to continue launching these missions. And he actually has to return to Canada for treatment in 1951. And what's crazy... How did you... How did you what's up? How did you feel as a 18, 19-year-old kid in the military doing those, like, those those long ruck marches and whatnot? Like, could you feel the toll on your body? Or were you, could you just handle it? Like, were you fine with oh, it? Oh, 100%. I could feel the toll on my body, man. There was one week I remember where, like, at the end of the week, I genuinely felt like an 80-year-old man. I was like... That's what an 80-year-old man feels like. <laughs> Can't bend over to tie your shoes. You're like, nope. <laughs> Dude, I mean, me as an example, I'm a terrible example. I was completely unprepared, immature, 18-year-old kid, way in over my head. So I, I had to rely a lot on being... I genuinely, a lot of the time, I was just too scared to quit. You know, like, I don't want to put myself in any sort of area even close to this guy. This guy was just an unbelievable hero, and I was just some idiot that sort of, you know grinded through it but i can i can only imagine what his knees felt like you know and and we like we t- touched on you know doing 70 kilometer reconnaissance patrols deep into enemy territories in mountainous terrain that stuff does not that stuff does not leave you ever especially when we have medical systems that would not have been great back then but what's yeah. crazy oh, your, is your knee hurts let me stab it with this needle you're fine <laughs> yeah exactly how about a bit of cocaine <laughs> you know who knows what they were doing but what's cool is he leaves for medical treatment in 1951, and he's back in Korea in 1952. That's crazy. That's a that's a super short timeline, and he's just back at it. You know, he he has no interest in letting his fellow soldiers fight without him. He just gets right back into the field, and unfortunately, he gets injured again, and he spends you know weeks in hospital in Korea. And you know, while while he's in hospital recovering again, the Korean armistice is signed and. You know, 1953, the the war is over, and this time, unlike unlike the last time, Prince actually stays in the military and he um, becomes an instructor, right? Yeah, and he was there being an instructor. It was only about a year, assuming that the I'm actually not too sure when the Korean Armistice was signed, uh, but it was later in the year, um, like in terms of like date wise in 1953. But in 1953, October 28th, he was then honorably discharged, um, but he had stayed in the military for, not in the military, but like he had stayed as like, I'm not sure how it works. He was at the military depot for like another year uh, as like an instructor or, or something along those lines, but he wasn't technically a part of the military. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but for all intents and purposes, he was out of the military for the last time on October 28th, 1953. Uh, and through his military career, he had received uh, esteemed medals for his heroism. Uh, there was actually many medals, but I'm only going to mention the two. Um, he was one of 59 Canadians to receive the American Silver Star. It's not called the American Silver Star. It's just called the Silver Star, but it's an American medal. Um, and this was fifty out of one out of 59 Canadians out of 1 million Canadians that served in World War II. That is incredible. That is a huge percent. Like He is, he is part of elite company. With that medal. And of this 59 who had received the Silver Star, only three also received the military medal, which was granted by the King of Britain, right? So one out of 59 people out of a million, uh, and out of that, one out of three people out of a million who got this medal granted to him by a king. So it, it, it really is a shame seeing like how esteemed this man was and how important he was to our military history, how little people know about him. And maybe you could say that's a result of the fact that he's Native American, right? I, I don't know, but it's... Definitely didn't help. It's, yeah, he, he, yeah, he led an incredible life and he, he did a lot of great things for our country. Um, and after the Korean War, it was obviously there was no more wars until Vietnam. I don't, Canada wasn't too, too involved in that. So it was time for Prince to hang up his uniform for good. Um, he returned home to Canada, and he'd married a woman named Verna Sinclair, and he had five children with her. But a happy ending, as we alluded to earlier, was not in the books for this Canadian war hero. And uh, yeah, due to his time in military service, um, 
his body had been beaten down, debilitated. Uh, so you could see how it'd be difficult for him to successfully work a labor job. Not saying he couldn't, but you know, back then, like the, we didn't. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't have uh, occupational health and safety coming to the job site, making sure everybody had their steel toes and hard hats and gloves and safety glasses, saying if you're working more than twelve hours a day, you need to take a break. And blah blah blah. No, it was hey, you work until you're done working, and then once you're done working, you go home, and you're gonna be here tomorrow, right? Uh, you're lucky if you get your breaks and all that, right? It's a different time. And so he struggled to find gainful employment. Um, and and it, di it didn't help again, like, let alone the fact that his body was damaged, but, you know, this discrimination he still faced. It, and the, the 15 years he was in the military, not much changed in Canada, right, from 1940 to 1955 regarding how that population was treated. Um, didn't stop him, though, from showing the true colors of his character and uh, being the hero he was. And in June of 1955, he actually, he jumped into the water at the Alexander Docks in Winnipeg and he saved a man. He saved a man from drowning. So you got to think, man, this, this guy who everybody's just beating him down, his body's beat down, he has no opportunity, he's down and out. He's still willing to put his life on the line to save another human being. That is remarkable. Um, Riley has said the word too many times and I don't, not too many times. He said it many times, but I don't think it can be said too many that he was a, he was a born and bred hero. And, uh, I hope that after this episode, uh, of our Canadian listeners, you two, you guys as well can be, be proud that, uh, he represented our flag. Well, and that's an interesting thing though, is, you know, that he, he did represent the flag, you know, he did represent Canada as a nation, you know, and like I was saying, I don't want to touch on his opinions and I don't know what his opinions were but I really think that he he could see the potential that the that Canada had you know and he wanted to be a force for change he wasn't he wasn't a victim there's never a time in this story even though we're going to get to the end of his life which is pretty tragic but even though this is how his life ended there's never a point in this story where Tommy Prince is a victim he's someone that when People tried time and time again to beat him down. He never let he never let them win, you know. But at this point in his life, what's been given to him? Nothing's been given to him except for a broken body, potential PTSD, labor certainly struggle. PTSD. Well, no, you can't say certainly, but like <laughs> I suppose, yeah. This culmination of events. He, it leads to him being estranged from his family and a lot of his children ended up in foster care and Prince ended up turning to alcohol and the remainder of his life is spent alone, whether in shelters or on the streets. And, you know, this is a, a story that's far too common with military veterans where they just get completely abandoned and, and you know, life, <laughs> life kicks their ass and without the structure of the military without the family and they just um, end up in really dire circumstances. He, he at one point ends up having to sell his medals in order to, uh, to provide for himself. And I think, I think something that um, should be touched on uh, regardless of your political affiliation, whether you, whatever part of the spectrum you're on and however you feel about whatever wars are fought by our veterans these guys might not believe in it as well, but they have taken a they've taken an oath to defend our country, right? So when that bell gets rung, they stand up and they answer. So it doesn't matter if you don't believe in the conflict. Like it's not about the conflict. Um, it's about the people who go and fight for us, right? Who keep our borders safe, who allow us to have the freedoms and uh, all the things we get to enjoy in this beautiful country. And I think I, I want to take a moment personally to say that I think um, a lot more could be done for them, right? Again regardless of the military conflict these are these are people who they're exceptional right like i i can say with myself like i i don't know if i would have the courage in 1942 or 1939 sorry if you know somebody came to my house and said we need bodies i'm sending you to france right or sending you you know to, to britain to stage for the war would i have the courage i'd like to believe so right but many many men did um, women as well back home, but that's not the point is that these people deserve to be taken care of because they decided to put themselves at risk to take care of us. Fast forward to 1977. He ends up dying in Winnipeg at Deer Lodge Center, an old folks home specialized towards veterans. And a positive ending to this story is that Prince's medals were fortunately recovered by his nephew, Jim Bear. They are now displayed at the Manitoba Museum in Winnipeg if you want to go check them out. 
and the Canadian government abandoned many Canadian veterans, especially natives. This must have been devastating, as one of Prince's main convictions for serving was the quote, prove that natives were just as good as the white man. I think that uh, I think that he more than proved that, you know, and I think that he's a great example of progress and of making it inarguable. There is no argument on planet Earth that you could come to me and tell me that Tommy Prince didn't prove that Native Americans are fantastic members of society and have the potential to be, you know, above and beyond for this this nation, for, you know, whatever nations that they still identify with. And to end, you know, I don't know if you want to add anything else, Ashton. Um... Yeah, I don't know, man. One little fun fact, I suppose, is that uh, there's the possibility that he'll be on our $5 bill moving forward. That bill was put forward in uh, 2020. So that's, I think that personally is really cool. But uh, yeah, if yeah, you no, can, if you can, and you've listened to this podcast and you see some like petition to sign for Tommy Prince to be on the $5 bill, sign it. <laughs> he deserves it. 100%. 100%. Um, yeah. Like, let's, let's spread some awareness about this, uh, this tried and true hero. There's not much more to say that isn't just, uh, us uh, our, our our feelings and opinions on the matter but i'm sure you guys have heard enough of that through this episode so uh, let's let's uh well there is one last thing i want to say you know i do want to mention that throughout this podcast we've mentioned time and time again that tommy prince he believed in doing what is best and not taking no for an answer you know this story it reminds me of a quote from timothy snyder's book on tyranny and he says a patriot wants the nation to live up to its ideals, which means asking us to be our best selves. A patriot must be concerned with the real world, which is the only place where his country can be loved and sustained. A patriot has universal values, standards by which he judges his nation, always wishing it well, and wishing that it would do better. And I think that this is a great example of a time where Canada could have done better. And the man himself did everything he could to prove that he deserved more, his people deserved more. And I think that that's something that we can take into the future. You know, about 50% of our listeners are Canadian. So just take a second to remember the, the people that were here before us, the people that will be here with us into the future. And that, you know, there's a lot that can still be done. And that these stories are things that we have to remember when we're thinking that, you know, we can't do more. We can always do more. And that this is one of the greatest nations on earth. And the greatest part about it is that we can do better. We will do better. And I'm happy to end it there, man. How about you? Yeah, I'm good to go. I, uh, you know, love your fellow man. That's really all I got to say. You know, yeah. skin skin color skin color is just such a the only only thing only reason cultural background should be significant is what you can learn from one another absolutely you know we want to thank you for listening to us at the human histories podcast like i said earlier there's a couple ways to support us the best way is to hit that follow button subscribe and come back next week you know if you want to support us financially hit us up on patreon at human histories podcast and also just follow us on our social medias at instagram at human histories podcast you know we'll be doing a giveaway hopefully in the near future here and i hope that you guys can just be part of the community enjoy the content we're putting out and send us positive feedback send us ways we can improve stuff we missed if you know anything about tommy prince that we missed man we would love to know you know i'm i'm constantly curious so i hope that you guys enjoyed the podcast We'd also love to uh, have a questions episode. So if you guys have any questions, by all means, send them our way. doesn't matter how long, how short. We will do our best to answer them in typical uh, Riley and Ashton fashion with lots of anecdotes and rambling. Perfect. All right. Take it easy, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for listening.